All right, so um, you want to talk about cables. Yeah, let's dive in. You've come to the right place. We're about to take a deep dive into the fascinating world of South Korean cables. These aren't, uh, you see, they're not just companies. It's, it's something else entirely. Yeah. Imagine family empires. Okay. But instead of, you know, ruling a country, they control like huge chunks yeah. of an entire nation's economy. Wow. We're talking smartphones, cars even, you know, the music you listen to. Yeah, that's right. We're talking Samsung, Hyundai, LG. Right. But think bigger, much bigger. Yeah. In 2021, the top 10 cables alone pulled in over a trillion dollars in revenue. Yeah. To put that into perspective, that's roughly 60% of South Korea's entire GDP. Wow. It's a level of economic concentration that's almost unimaginable in most other developed countries. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's mind boggling. Yeah. Okay. So let's unpack this. How did a handful of families climb to such dizzying heights of economic power? Did they like invent some magical money tree back in the day or what? Well, it's a story that's deeply intertwined with South Korea's history. Yeah. We need to rewind to the 1960s oh, when the mean? country was still reeling from the Korean War and, you know, Strug struggling to find its economic footing. Okay. Yeah. So picture this. A nation grappling with poverty, desperate for a way out. And then enters Park Chung-hee, the president, with a bold, some might say risky, vision. Right, exactly. Yeah. So Park decided to go all in on a handful of key industries, electronics, shipbuilding, machinery, petrochemicals, and non-ferrous metals. Those are some big industries. Yeah. And to jumpstart these sectors, he handpicked certain companies. Wow. Nurturing them, providing them with capital, and shielding them from competition. So it sounds like, yeah. it sounds like these chosen few, you guessed it, blossomed into the mighty cables we know today. Samsung, Hyundai, LG, and the rest. And this period often called the miracle on the Han River, saw South Korea transform from an impoverished nation to a global economic force in just a few decades. It's important to understand, this wasn't just about economic growth, though it was definitely about that. It was about national pride. It was about proving to the world that South Korea could rise from the ashes and compete on the world stage. So they were almost like national champions carrying the hopes and dreams of a nation on their shoulders. In many ways, they were and they delivered propelling South Korea into the modern era. And they became synonymous with cutting edge technology and innovation. Yeah. But this rapid ascent, this concentration of power, it didn't come without a cost. Right, and that's what we're gonna delve into next. The dark side of the cable story. From allegations of corruption and bribery to accusations of stifling competition, the path to success is rarely without its bumps. And in the case of the cables, those bumps can feel more like craters. It's interesting how this miracle on the Han River you mentioned seems to have like two sides to it. On the one hand, you have this inspiring story of a nation pulling itself up by its bootstraps, becoming a global economic powerhouse. But on the other, there's this shadow of corruption and, you know, unfair practices lurking behind the success stories. Yeah, it's like um, <laughs> it's a classic case of the ends justifying the means, at least for a while, you know. Yeah. But as South Korea has matured economically and socially, those means have come under increasing scrutiny. You can only sweep so much under the rug, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. And let's not forget, I mean, we live in a different world now. The information age, social media, it's all about transparency and accountability. You, you can't know. just silence dissent or brush scandals under the rug anymore. People are watching and they're demanding better. Especially the younger generation. Yeah. Yeah, imagine inheriting this legacy of both, you know, incredible wealth and an ethical ambiguity. Wow. Think about the pressure of being a chevalier in the age of social media, where every move is scrutinized, every misstep amplified a thousand times. Yeah, it's like you said earlier, the cables were almost like national champions, symbols of South Korea's success. Yeah. But what happens when those symbols no longer resonate with a new generation that values different things? Like, mm. I don't know, fairness, sustainability, social justice. Mm hmm. That's the million dollar question. Yeah. We're starting to see a shift in the economic landscape, a pushback against the dominance of the cables. OK. And it's coming from a new breed of entrepreneurs, many of whom, you know, cut their teeth within the cable system itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You mean they're like cable alumni striking out on their own? Exactly. That's fascinating. What's driving this entrepreneurial spirit? I think it's a combination of factors. Some are simply hungry for the freedom and autonomy that comes with building something from the ground up, right? They're tired of the bureaucracy, the family politics, the sense that their destiny is predetermined. They want to be their own boss. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they're not alone. We're witnessing a startup boom in South Korea. 
fueled by a generation that's tech savvy, globally connected, and willing to challenge the status quo. So we've got like David versus Goliath, yeah. but in the tech world, yeah. I'm dying to know, are there any examples of these David versus Goliath battles playing out right now? Absolutely. So take Coupang, for example. They're an e-commerce platform that's become incredibly popular, especially among younger consumers. And they're going head to head with Chable owned companies like Shinsegae, which owns a massive department store chain. Wow. Yeah. In a battle for market share. So it's like a clash of the titans. Yeah. But with like online shopping carts instead of swords and shields. Uh, I love it. Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me is this idea of the cables being like deeply embedded in the fabric of South Korean society. Right. Oh, absolutely. It's not well, just the businesses. It's everything. It's, it's everything. Yeah. It's true. Their influence extends far beyond the boardroom. They own media companies, sports teams, even entertainment agencies. They shape popular culture. They yeah. influence political discourse. And they play a significant role in shaping public opinion. Yeah, so to really understand the impact of the K-Balls, uh -huh. you have to look beyond the balance sheets, uh -huh. right? And consider their influence on everything from the K-pop you listen to to the news you consume. It's a level of influence that's hard to fathom, really. It really is. And that influence is now being challenged as a new generation demands change, demands a more equitable and transparent system. Okay, so we've got this clash of generations, a, a battle for the future of South Korea's economy. Mm. But what about the cables themselves? Are they just going to sit back and watch their empire crumble? Or are they capable of adapting, you know, of evolving to meet the demands of a changing world? It's almost like watching um, like a slow motion tug of war, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, I see that. On one side, you have the cables these titans of industry that have shaped South Korea for decades. And on the other, you have this rising tide of entrepreneurship, a new generation hungry for change. So who's going to win? It's the it's the question everyone's asking, isn't it? Right. And the truth is, I don't know if there's an easy answer, right? The cables, for all their flaws, are remarkably resilient. They have deep pockets, powerful connections, and a knack for adapting, albeit sometimes reluctantly to changing circumstances. So They've weathered their fair share of storms in the past. They have. But this feels different, doesn't it? This isn't just about economic cycles or shifting global markets. It's about a fundamental shift in values, a growing desire for a, a more equitable and just society. Can the cables really adapt to that? Some believe they can. There's been a noticeable shift in rhetoric, at least, towards embracing things like corporate social responsibility and sustainability. We're seeing investments in renewable energy, social impact initiatives, even attempts to improve corporate governance. So, so like, it's a bit of a charm offensive, trying to win over those skeptical millennials and Gen Zers. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But can a fresh coat of paint really cover up decades of deeply entrenched practices? I'm curious. What would it actually take for the cables to truly reform, to become a force for positive change in South Korea? It would require a seismic shift, not just in their business practices, but in their mindset, I think. It would mean prioritizing long-term value creation over short-term profits, embracing transparency and accountability, and empowering a new generation of leaders willing to challenge the status quo. It almost sounds like you're describing a completely different kind of company. One that's less about family dynasties and more about meritocracy, innovation, and social responsibility. In some ways, yeah, I think so. I think you're right. So it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion that the cables are destined to go the way of the dinosaurs. Not at all. But their future will depend on their ability to acknowledge and address the legitimate concerns being raised. They need to move beyond superficial gestures and commit to meaningful reforms that resonate with a public that's becoming increasingly disillusioned with the status quo. It seems like we've reached a pivotal moment in South Korea's economic history. The choices that K-Balls make in the coming years will have far-reaching consequences, not just for themselves, but for the entire country. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's not just about South Korea either. The K-Ball story holds valuable lessons for anyone grappling with the challenges of economic inequality, corporate power, and the role of innovation in shaping a more just and sustainable future. Yeah, this deep dive has given us a lot to think about, that's for sure. It's a reminder that even the most powerful institutions are not immune to change, and that the future is often shaped by those who are brave enough to challenge the status